Subcommittee on Forests looked at laws and regulations governing America's national forest today. Members heard from the chief of the U.S. Forest Service, Dale Bosworth. Colorado Congressman Scott McGinnis chairs this hearing. It's an hour 45 minutes. Hey, I'm hesitant to start this meeting, Chairman of the Full Committee, but uh, we understand that Mr. McKinnis, the uh, subcommittee chair, is uh, it's coming down from Bethesda right now and is hurrying down here. Uh, possibly if uh, the uh, colleagues on the committee wouldn't mind, it would be a good time to give our opening statements before we turn to uh, Chief Bosworth. Just and uh, with that in mind, I turn to the ranking member, uh, Mr. Ensley from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for joining us, Chief. We're always glad to have you here. We're sorry, Mr. McKinnis has been very involved in the fire efforts in Colorado, too. He's been a busy guy. Recently, we hope that uh, your agency is doing the best possible in that regard, and good luck in that regard. I may know parenthetically, I think there's some bad news out, this, out there for future fires with the global warming prospect that we face and a new report out about the potential droughts that we face in the West. I'm afraid we might be in for a few decades of this until we get a handle on global warming. Uh, I look forward to your testimony today. I'll just make a couple comments briefly about it. Um, um, one of the things that strikes me is uh, on this topic of, of management and efficiency and decision making in the Forest Service, uh, if you step back from it, it, it looks to me like uh, one of the things that has driven this issue is that essentially we've had a, a bit of a change of mission of the Forest Service in the last couple of decades. And that we've been going through a culture shift um, both nationally and, and in the Forest Service that are associated with our laws. And that is a, a transition from looking at our forests as predominantly for resource extraction industries to now, rep to now valuing and representing and, and using the other good assets and resources of the forest for recreation and good quality water and open space and, and habitat for wildlife. And, and it strikes me that this shift, we're still in the process of doing that to reach a new balance in our forests. And in that process, I don't think it's surprising that we've had controversy in that regard, that there has been um, questions about the right decision making and that there's been litigation when the Forest Service has not, at least according to some citizens' view, followed the law. So I just want to parenthetically state, I don't think it's, it's surprising that we've had controversy about the decision-making in the Forest Service as we've gone through this cultural shift. Second thing I want to say is I think there's a lot of things, and I'll look forward to your testimony today, about that the Forest Service can be doing, even absent legislation, to ease this decision-making. Because I really believe, and I've seen it up in the Northwest, where if the Forest Service decides to listen to the public and listen to the values the local public has been advocating, they can avoid a lot of controversy. Let me give an example. By moving away from some of the very controversial old growth proposed timber sales in the Northwest, down the lower slopes of, of uh, newer growth thinning operations, where we can have cuts uh, that are non-controversial. It's a management decision I think the Forest Service can and should be making, and we look forward to talking with you about how to do that, and perhaps even from a legislative standpoint about how to make those type of transitions. So I'll look forward to your thoughts about how we move in those directions. But bottom line is, um, I think we'll come out of this hearing um, with a finding uh, that listening to the public will help us get over a lot of these problems. And of course, that's something we'll be talking about the roadless rule with you too in that regard. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gentleman from uh, Colorado, Mr. Tancredo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's little that, um, uh, that can actually focus one's attention on this kind of a problem like an 80,000 acre blaze going in one state as we sit here and speak today. Uh, people perhaps don't understand exactly if the, what that really means, putting it in perspective for people who live out here. <clears throat> 87,000 acres, which is what we have now, is uh, twice, is, is actually 135.9 square miles, which is about twice 
the uh, area of Washington, D.C. Uh, that is what is involved in one blaze so far in Colorado, and there are, of course, several others that are ongoing. This is uh, an incredibly tragic situation caused, we believe, by a careless campfire being uh, uh, unattended. Um, out of every single tragedy, there is something that we can hope for in, the, in way of a positive uh, development. In this particular case, I think it is, uh, it is perhaps going to be helpful, this conflagration is going to be helpful in getting people to the table and understanding that there are ways in which these kinds of fires can be dealt with, can be minimized. We will always, of course, have and should always have fires. They are healthy part of the ecosystem. But these kinds of fires, the fires we're talking about here, the ones we had just in the recent past, High Meadows, Buffalo Creek, Snaking Fire, these are not healthy fires. These are fires that do far more damage to the, to the ground and the surrounding ecology than would have been the case if it had been able to be a fire burning uh, in more of a natural surrounding, that is to say, in a, in a less densely forested area. And the way in which that um, better management policy can be developed uh, the better management of a forest can be developed is through a cooperative effort on your part and ours, what we can do to help you overcome the inertia that exists within the agency. Um, that's what I want to hear today. I'm hoping that, that you're going to be able to help us figure out what we can do uh, to move away some of the obstacles that prevent the analysis paralysis that we've heard so much about. Um, I think that the concept of charter forests uh, is one way to attack that problem, is to give greater flexibility to the forest management, uh, to the forest management uh, idea and uh, operation. Um, but I'm interested in knowing what you will tell us about that. And um, I, I just, it's fascinating. I have a picture here of um, the High Meadow Fire and uh, where it burned and where it stopped and in Colorado, and something I'm going to pass along here to, to my colleagues. Um, if anybody is still questioning whether or not management, forest management can work in order to minimize the destructiveness of these kinds of fires, this is, this is po I think, you know, proof positive that it can be done. Where the forest had been thin, where we had been working, uh, we saw the, the, the line, the fire line stop almost, almost exactly. Um, you know, it comes out of the, the fire came out of the treetops, onto the ground, burned uh, lower to the ground, and eventually put itself out. Uh, we know what can happen. We know what we can do, and that's the most disconcerting aspect of this. We, I think, now know how to manage force a lot better. The problem is extreme environmentalists on one side and bureaucratic inertia on the other have prevented us from managing it. I mean, at least that's my observation at, the point, at this time, and I would sincerely appreciate, and I'm certainly glad you're here today to give us your observation. But those two things, oh, and the last thing is that I'd like you to comment on is a proposal that we introduced last night is the, to, to increase fines for people who do, in fact, start campfires um, in areas where they should not. I mean. Believe this or not, we had the first night of the Hayman fire when um, uh, helicopters were taking water into the fire. They overflew seven other campfires in the same area. When some of these people were contacted, they were willing to sort of chip in the five bucks a piece to pay the $25 fine. So I'd like to hear your comments on that too. I'm going to keep us real tight on the opening statements because I want you to have plenty of time, committee, uh, for an exchange with the uh, direct with the chief afterwards. Uh, Mr. Udall, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me uh, first of all just say that, that to my 
uh, colleagues in Colorado that, that uh, I, I know what you're experiencing. We had the Cerro Grande fire and a number of fires in, in New Mexico in 2000. Uh, as your fires rage right now, uh, we have uh, uh, thousands and thousands of acres also burning. So uh, we're once again in a fire situation that, that uh, uh, is out of control. And as, as the chief knows, these, um, these catastrophic fires are a different kind of fire. I mean, you talk to the, the incident commanders and they say they haven't seen the fires rage like this. They, they have their own weather conditions. They burn in a way that, that is out of control, and it's something that, that um, we really need to tackle. And I guess my message to you, uh, Chief, and you know this, but, uh, but to the public is this is a, a long-term situation. We need to commit the resources over the long term to make sure this is done. This, uh, we're not going to get out of the conditions that, that my colleague from Colorado talked about in a couple of years. I mean, we've gotten into this situation over 100 years. It's going to take us quite a while to get out, and so we need to have that uh, long-term commitment. And once again, my, uh, my sympathies to, to Colorado and what you all are going through. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hayworth. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank my colleagues. And, Chief, we welcome you today, and we thank you for coming down to, to visit with us during the course uh, of, of this hearing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my colleagues, it, it strikes me that, that some who may join us uh, via television, uh, aside from the obvious anguish of the fires that we see in the West, might be worth going into some background just to point out that so much of the land in the West belongs to the federal government. So, for example, Gila County, Arizona, 97% of the county owned by some governmental entity. Not all the federal government, but still, when you consider that roughly 3% of the county is private property, uh, it is problematic. Because when you are dealing with questions of what might be called, in an urban setting, zoning or property management, in the western United States, uh, the landlord, in many cases, is the federal government. And I, I would second uh, the comments of my colleagues today as we are dealing and confronting with uh, the fire danger. Uh, Chief, uh, we pointed out, and as fires rage in, in southern Arizona, uh, perhaps not as dramatic, but certainly as devastating in their own way as what we are seeing now in, in Colorado, uh, I think it's important to reiterate uh, that, uh, that we have seen what has been characterized here with a rather elegant, uh, politically scientific term of bureaucratic inertia, and translated to everyday language. That is folks in government service choosing, through delaying tactics, not to carry out the will of the people in constitutional officers, and sometimes by delay, subverting the law of the land. The challenge we confront on the fires is obviously one that, uh, that uh, in terms of public policy triage, is front and center. But there are other issues that emerge, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you as next week we will hold a hearing to go in uh, more in depth on the new Education Land Grant Act, which we passed unanimously through this House, which was passed by the Senate, which was signed into law by President Clinton on December 28th of the year 2000. And I just think, Mr. Chairman, in my opening statement, I would be remiss if I did not point out a perfect example of the type of bureaucratic inertia and the type of change in culture we need to see in the Forest Service uh, that's long overdue. We put together a conference in Phoenix in the fall of last year uh, for Arizona school districts that were interested in applying for land conveyances under the new Education Land Grant Act to convey non-environmentally sensitive public land at a low cost to these districts. I have to report to this committee, and again, I will go more in depth next week in the hearing, the conference was met with major resistance from the Forest Service. In fact, although Forest Service officials had initially confirmed that they would participate in the conference, and certainly they have a key role in providing information to school districts, they apparently decided to sabotage the event by not showing up at the conference without giving any notice to me or any member of my staff, save a last-minute message on a, staff, a staffer's cell phone, on the voicemail. 
Finally, upon my personal demand that they do so, two officials did make an appearance at the conference and proceeded to outline various hoops the school districts must jump through and pay for in order to qualify for a land conveyance. As it turns out, local Forest Service personnel had a presentation complete with PowerPoint slides ready to go for the conference, but they were told at the last minute by bureaucrats in Washington not to attend the conference, presumably because implementation, implementation procedures were still unclear. The reluctance by the Forest Service to implement the law, aside from efforts of the Forest Service to make conveyances more costly for school districts, can only be interpreted as an effort to frustrate the obvious intent of the law. This is a prime example of bureaucratic inertia. Now, to be fair for purposes of full disclosure, I am heartened by the fact that in Georgia, uh, the Chattahoochee Oconee National Forest, there, the first land grant will be completed under this act next month. But right now in Arizona, uh, we have a couple of applications that are just sitting as victims of bureaucratic inertia. I say this, Chief, because we want to work with you. And there needs to be a culture shift, and if it must begin in the Forest Service, let it begin now to implement the law of the land and to put an end to the unelected deciding what laws they will follow and what laws they will ignore. I look forward to your testimony, and I thank the chairman for the time. Mr. Otter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Chief. Uh, uh, I, as you know, just walked in and I only had, got to hear my colleague from New Mexico, my colleague from Colorado, and now Arizona. Uh, and it is extremely frustrating. Uh, I'm sure as you are short time in your office, you already know that. And we've all got our ideas on how to probably break down gridlock. <laughs> gridlock. Uh, unfortunately, for some, gridlock is exactly what they want. Uh, but for others, uh, for those that have lost their jobs, and for the school districts that have closed down in Idaho, for the 880,000 acres that burned up uh, two years ago and now lays waste and is devastating our fisheries and is devastating our, our watershed um, and really uh, creating quite a bit of havoc in those watersheds. Uh, uh, those of us uh, that live on the land out there and... Uh, for the most part, to uh, try to represent what is good for the land. We want gridlock over with. Uh, if, uh, and I, I'm not exactly sure, I wish I had the magic wand that I could wave. Uh, uh, my Lord didn't grant me with the wisdom to come up with uh, the solutions to all these ideas. Uh, but I would hope that most of your energies would be directed toward uh, overcoming gridlock. If we have to bring everybody to the table, uh, however, we have to do it. Uh, I think we ought to set a timeline and say by this date it's going to be over with because I, I think unless we set ourselves a drop-dead date uh, on when we're going to have processes that will allow us to defend ourselves from hazards that we would not allow to exist anyplace else, uh, potential devastation to water sheds, sheds and fisheries and communities and jobs uh, and those sort of things, uh, uh, we would not allow that to happen anywhere else. If that was in some, if that same disastrous uh, overgrowth, uh, if that same disastrous uh, hazard w existed in Washington D.C., we would marshal every force, every we would deploy every talent and every piece of equipment at our disposal in order to eradicate that potential disaster. And so I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm sure, like, as you can hear that frustration in my colleagues. Whatever we do, let's get it over with. Their gridlock is, is actually serving uh, the intentions uh, of a lot of folks. To do nothing is exactly what they want. Uh, but it's also uh, devastating communities. It's ruining lives. Uh, it's ruining watersheds. The very thing that we seek to protect uh, is now being devastated. So uh, I look forward to uh, hearing your comments, but uh, I really look forward to hearing the date or the time or the years or the months that you're prepared to set and say, by this time, we're going to have this thing behind us and we're going to go forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And <coughs> once again, Chief, thanks for being here. Uh, my apologies to the Chairman. I should have called on you first. Uh, chairman, opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, let me just say that uh, if you go back and read the charter of the Forest Service from 1905 up to today, much of it is predicated on one word. It's called manage. And we give these folks a tremendous responsibility to manage the grounds of America or the Forest Service of America. And as I, and I've known Dale Bosworth a long time, and I feel very comfortable with him as chief. I know how capable he is. He worked in areas of Ogden, Utah, an extremely capable man, and I don't think we could do better. I also know in BLM, if I may say, talk about that for just a second, Kathy Clark is also a very competent young lady, has a very good knowledge of things. And between the two of them, we worked some of this out. But we're talking about the frustrations we have. We've all got them. There's a lot of frustrations out there right now. You know, I would challenge members of the committee to go on the next break is to take a half day and go to your local forester and have him show you the forest. You know what you're going to find? You're going to find more fuel load than we've probably ever had in the history of the forest. And I'm not trying to place any blame on anyone, but some folks were of a mind that we don't clean the forest, we don't thin the forest, we don't have prescribed fires. And as you know, we're going to have a hearing in the near, very near future in the full committee, which will talk about the amount of lawsuits that have been filed against the Forest Service and the BLM and how it's bogged them down. Now, I'm sure Chief Bosworth will be at that meeting. I think you're going to be amazed at what these people are going to tell you. Right now, they spend 40 to 60 percent of their time filling out charts of NEPA, trying to take care of that. So a lot of this kind of rests here in Congress. We probably have made such a fudge factory for a lot of these folks to go through that we got to start straightening up some of these things so they can do what they were asked to do in 1905, which worked then and will work today, and that is manage the grounds of America. When you got that many people working on NEPA problems, now add to that, I've given to understand, and I'm sure the chief will give us better information at our next hearing, there's 5,000 legal actions pending against the Forest Service right now of May of 2002. I was talking to Kathy Clark the other day on BLM, and I said, how much of your budget do you spend on litigation? She said, just a tad over 50%. So we're going to give all this money to the BLM, and they're spending on litigation. And over disrespect, well, I don't know if I have respect or not, for American trial attorneys who have found another thing besides tobacco and asbestos that to go after and to file one lawsuit on top of another <clears throat> which really are predicated on some of our extreme environmental groups. So let's say to our, our managers of the public land, let's let them have the opportunity to manage the forest. Let's see them clean the forest. You know, remember back, and boy, this will really date you if you remember this, but there used to be something called the CCC boys, and they went in and they thinned the forest, they cleaned the forest, and the forest looked pretty good. And now we've got a deadfall and fuel load like you can't believe. Of course we're going to have fires. We have a very fine forest supervisor who retired not long ago in the state of Utah. His name is Hugh Thompson. He's now working for Natural Resources. Hugh had the Dixie Forest. Dixie Forest years ago when the first pioneers came in those valleys was nothing. It was just nothing. And they started planting. The Forest Service went in. They created one of the most beautiful forests there is in America called the Dixie Forest in southern Utah. And then up by Cedar Breaks, they had an infestation of something called the pine beetle. Hugh wanted to go in and cut out about 17,000 acres. Nope, got a lawsuit just like that. Stopped him. But the trouble is, those little beetles just kept eating away. And the time he got through the first one, another lawsuit. Now, I would just challenge any of you, and as an old pilot, I go down there occasionally and fly over it. And you know what you got? You got dead sticks. It looks like dead toothpicks all over the place. And I started thinking about the time that we had a really great forester in here in the 80s. And we were talking about the Uinta Mountains, and there was a fellow from one of the extreme environmental groups, and he stood up and said, don't touch it, leave it alone, don't even come close. And this forester said, I don't have a dog in this fight, but let me tell you what's going to happen. If we don't go in and clean out that infestation of pine beetles, you're going to have a dead forest. And he said, I will guarantee you will have a fire. I said, I can guarantee you'll have a fire, and that beautiful green carpet that you don't want touched will be an ugly, dirty mess. And his next comment was, and I think I can guarantee you'll have a flood. And if you're going to do it nature's way that we keep hearing around here, then it'll take 100 years before you'll see that force back to what it was when it was that green cord. This gentleman doesn't have the option of just letting it go. He has to take care of the forest as the BLM has to do. So I just say to my friends here, this is an extremely important issue that we have in front of us today, but I wanted to add the dimension of we, Congress, have created a lot of this fudge factory ourselves and 
One thing we could move into would be, be Rule 28, uh, civil procedure on how these lawsuits are filed, and I would urge the committee to do it. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, we keep having members come in, and so I'm going to limit the, uh, I'm going to allow two more opening statements on your side, two more on this side, and I'm closing off opening statements, and the rest of you can submit it for the record. We're, we're going to take all this time, or we're not going to get to hear from the chief, and that's who we want to hear from. We all hear from each other all the time. So, uh, Mr. Inslee, I guess I'll just go in the order of how they're seated. If that's all right with you, I'll let you decide, but know, two of the three get an opening statement. Is it Udall Monopoly? Mr. Udall, you came in next. You can proceed. I'll go in the order that you showed up, Mr. Udall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the spirit of your comments, I'll be very uh, brief. Uh, I did want to echo the concerns of my colleagues from Colorado, particularly uh, Mr. Tancredo and Mr. McGinnis, when it comes to the Hayman Fire and the situation we now face in Colorado. And Chief, I'm looking forward to hearing your comments. Uh, I also support uh, what my colleague, Mr. Tancredo, has uh, proposed in, when it comes to increasing the fines for fire, f uh, campfires that uh, shouldn't have been set in the first place and the incredible damage they can cause. And all of us in the Colorado delegation have worked on the fire plan and fuel reduction efforts over the last uh, couple of years. And I just want to emphasize, uh, again, that we need to get those resources into the urban wildland interface, the so-called red zone. And I'm eager to do all I can to help the Forest Service and work with my colleagues to see that that's the case. And finally, I would say this is a long-term problem. We have to, we're in it uh, in, on a marathon basis. This has been developing for certainly 100 years. We have more to learn about the forest ecosystems and the best way to manage those forests. But if we can all pull together, find our common ground, uh, I'm optimistic that we can reduce these hazards and return our forests to a healthier condition. I thank you, Chief, for coming up to the Hill today. Uh, Mr. Yule, uh, Mr. Udall, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and let you yield your three minutes and 45 seconds to Mr. Holt. Ms. McCall, I, I will uh, be next. happy to yield uh, my time to my colleague from New Jersey, Mr. Holt. Have you had a chance to? Mr. Holt, you can proceed. She's going to get a full five minutes, but you're on your time right now. Okay. Uh, you can share uh, no, that's, I, I yield, uh, uh, you can yield your time to another. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> well, go ahead, uh, Ms. McCollum, you may proceed for five minutes. Opening statement. Do you have an opening statement? Uh, no, I don't, Mr. Chair. I have another markup, so I'm going to have to leave. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll wrap it up then. Uh, first of all, Chief, I want you to know that um, uh, we just finished the White River National Forest Plan. And the regulations, and the comment period, and the things, I mean, we, we've asked for public input. And our democracy of 200 years, frankly, I think, has, has saddled your agency with regulations and input. And everybody that I talk to thinks they know how to run that force better than you people know how to. And unfortunately, I think your agency has been somewhat bashful or timid about saying, hey, why don't we let the experts come in? And instead, we're taking more and more public comment. And I'll give you an idea. I, as you know, in the White River National Forest was appalled by the alternative that they came up with, which for the first time in the history of forest planning set human use it's a lower priority than uh, ecological or biological use. Any ecological or biological use uh, took priority over any human use. So I submitted my own forest plan, which was a, a very thick, complicated, detailed document prepared by scientists. That was the science. I had, when I went into your office in Glenwood Springs, one of the Forest Service employees wouldn't even sh shake my hand. It was embarrassing for me. I put my hand out, and he, wouldn't, he said, I'm not going to shake the hand of someone like you. Well, I'm wondering what, the, the, what, what was happening there. Now, fortunately, uh, Martha Cattell and uh, Rick Cables and some of those people uh, responded. But we also heard that, look, despite the fact that the chairman of the Forest Committee, the fact that he's Congress, the, the congressional representative of this district, elected by the people of this district, and the fact that his report was done with experts, including the former supervisor of the White River National Forest, which was my expert who primarily authored the report, so to speak, combined with the others, this should, uh, uh, some of these people say this comment should have the same as somebody off the street who sends a one sentence comment to your agency that says I either oppose the White River alternative or I support it. I mean, that's bureaucracy. We're flooding with it. And I know you know this. You, you, you came into this. You inherited this. On top of that, uh, I've just come, as you know, all the major uh, or most major fires, uh, including the big one right now, started in my district in Colorado. Saturday night, I was interrupted in a dinner to be told that my parents' home of 60 years had been burned to the ground. That was incorrect. 
but the fire was on all sides of them. By the time I got to Glenwood Springs, we had 100, they said we had 150 homes uh, in flames. I actually went in and did my own damage assessment because obviously having lived there, I know it like the back of my hand. The actual damage was per perhaps 30 homes. That said, uh, I, I want to tell you, your forest service out there with that fire and with every fire we've had so far in my district, which are the major fires we've had out there, your agency has been splendid. They've been there with their air tankers, their people are first class, and it seems to me that last year when we gave you these resources, we hired additional firemen, we hired additional equipment, we are clearly seeing a difference now with this fire season over what we saw last fire season. So if we can see that kind of improvement in, in the other parts of the agency that we deal with, as we have seen, in my opinion, the dramatic improvement in our fire management that I witnessed firsthand and spent the entire weekend with your people out there, uh, I think we can make some real progress. So I, it's clear from the comments made from this committee, and, and fortunately, everybody on this committee has uh, deep and intense experience with Forest Service property, in, in our own, all in our own ways. In my district, for example, 119 out of the 119, uh, 119 out of the approximately 120 communities are completely surrounded by public lands. So these are experienced voices, but you're an experienced leader. And I think that we can see some results. So I look forward to your testimony. And Chief, the time is yours. You're not going to be limited to five minutes. We want to hear your discussion, and then we'll open it up for a two-way discussion. Thank you. And Chief, you may proceed. And again, please, uh, Rick Cables, by the way, was, if, if there were some uh, metal I could give him, he was wonderful out there, right on the, right on the button. And Martha, the whole crew. So my, comment, my compliments to them. I hope you pass it on. Go ahead, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will pass those comments on. I appreciate hearing those, and I, uh, I, I know that the folks in the field will appreciate hearing that as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I, I really do want to thank you for the opportunity to, um, to, to continue the discussion that we started several months ago regarding the processes that some of our Forest Service line officers face in trying to make, uh, make decisions on the land and uh, trying, to, trying to comply with the myriad of uh, laws, regulations, and standards that end up being imposed on them. About six months ago, I told you that, that I'd asked a team to update former Chief Jack Ward Thomas's study on the Forest Service's legal and the, and the regulatory um, framework and to take into consideration any kind of new laws or new regulations, um, new court decisions that had happened in the, in the intervening years. And um, that, that report has been completed. And so I'm happy to uh, provide an, uh, 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 that report to you. <laughs> And I, I'd like to talk today about, about the report, and, and, and I'd like to talk some about how I expect and how I intend to begin to try to unravel the, the procedural knot in which the Forest Service is uh, bound at this time. The report that I'm giving you today doesn't, doesn't set out to, to uh, propose <coughs> solutions, and I want to be clear about this. We're not lo at this point in the report, we didn't want to talk about solutions. We want to develop consensus on the problem so that we can search for the right solutions. My big fear would be that we would come up with solutions in search of a problem, and I think we need to do it the other way around. And, um, and so if, as you see the report, uh, we'll find out whether or not there's any agreement that we've identified the right problem, that it is a problem, and then I think together we can move forward to start correcting that. Environmental laws and regulations, I don't believe are in conflict. The, uh, I think the fundamental problem is, is that, that the legal and the procedural requirements that the Forest Service has to comply with haven't been systematically developed or systematically constructed over time. They've really um, evolved over uh, probably 30 years in response to laws, uh, agency regulations, court decisions, public expectations, scientific uh, understanding, and, and they didn't have very much coordination, little or no coordination. And so that's sort of resulted in kind of three general problems. The first one I'll talk about is excessive analysis. We've created a, a short-term risk-averse atmosphere, which most of the time doesn't properly weigh the more significant long-term considerations or long-term consequences of, of only thinking about the short-term. The procedural requirements are imposed by regulatory agencies and the, and the courts just never stop. They just continue to pile on, to pile on. And that means that you have increased analysis and documentation, which is costly, it's complex, it's time-consuming, and often doesn't result in timely, timely decisions. 
And I think Congress and the public has every right to, to ask at the end of the day, is the result a better decision? I can't think of a better example that would sort of illustrate, uh, illustrate this point than, a, than a, um, a report that's called the Bestia Report. It's a commentary that was authored in 1995 by eight university uh, and government scientists. The paper's never been published in any scientific or professional journal. Uh, it's never been subject to any formal peer review. But in four cases now, courts have concluded that project decisions violated NEPA because the associated NEPA documents didn't adequately document the agency's consideration of the best report. And I think it's a good, but probably not, the, well, definitely not the only example of, of an incentive that our line officers feel to fill overstuff NEPA documents with excessive amounts of information, excessive amounts of analysis and documentation is time consuming and costly, but doesn't really contribute very much in the end to the quality of public involvement or land management. The question is, is that what Congress wants? And is that what the public wants? Another area is unproductive public involvement. A lot of our critics would say that we, avo we would avoid a lot of our problems if we'd only include the public earlier in our project planning. I think the reality is that I, I really don't believe that there's any other federal agency that provides more opportunities for public review and comment on proposed plans and projects than the Forest Service does. We try to do it early in the process. Um, at the very beginning, we, we, we involve the public all the way through the process, um, through multiple meetings, field trips often, to make sure that we understand what people are thinking. We encourage competing interests to sit down and reason together to try to find uh, ways to accommodate their, their various viewpoints and their various objectives. And the theory behind the approach is that it'll lead to more informed decisions and that those more informed decisions will have more uh, or broader public support. It can, I don't think it can be reasonably expected to mean that the Forest Service has to have unanimous support, unanimous support, for every aspect of a project if we're going to move forward. Ultimately, Forest Service officials have to end up making a decision based upon a lot of different factors, some of which may not be represented. However, the benefits of this dialogue with the public too often frustrates the public, just like it does the Forest Service. Now, my testimony that I, that I submitted uh, talks about the efforts of the Hiawatha National Forest to remove an existing concrete bridge across a creek called North Light Creek that's on the, uh, it's within the Grand Island Research Natural Area. And this bridge was breaking apart, chunks of concrete falling into the creek. The forest closed the bridge in 1995 and started scoping on a replacement bridge. There is a, a fair amount of public support, a lot of public support. In the initial scoping period and the uh, environmental assessment comment period, there was substantial, but not unanimous, support by local residents, recreation interests, and environmental groups for the project. One individual who had participated early in the process, but who had not opposed the project, appealed it. Although the appeal wasn't based on, uh, on the agency's consideration of alternatives, the, the, the regional office review then found that the document that at least the documentation of some other alternatives was lacking, and so the ranger had to withdraw the decision several months later. They subsequently decided to consider the bridge project in the context of revisions to the, to the uh, research natural area record um, of, the, of the establishment record, and the forest amendment, forest plan amendment, took about a year and a half to complete, and that one wasn't appealed. So now, here we are, we're scoping now again for the bridge replacement project, which began last June. We figured that construction of the replacement bridge could begin in 2005, so we end up with a single appellant that, that really overrode broad public support for a project when it was proposed in early 1995 and has pushed the bridge replacement back uh, 10 years. Um, again, this a small bridge, people just a uh, you know, safety issue, environmental issue, and the question is, is this what Congress wants? And is this what the public wants? The third problem is, um, is really us in the Forest Service. When I testified uh, before the subcommittee last year, I admitted that we were part of the problem. Uh, in, in the work that our folks did to develop the report, the team also found that agency leadership and management and planning decision making needs to be improved. I've asked our Deputy Chief for National Forest Systems, Tom Thompson, to undertake a comprehensive re-engineering of our processes internally to address those parts of the report that, that we can correct internally as an agency. 
So, Mr. Chairman, I want to close today with uh, pretty much the same message as I had last year. We're frustrated with the status quo. The Forest Service employees are committed to protecting and improving the quality of the land, the water and the wildlife and air, and, and with the goals of protecting and preserving this nation's precious historic and cultural resources. But I want to be sure that I'm, I want to be clear that I'm not here, I'm not coming here to dump a problem in your laps or to come here and say that, that, that this is your problem. I'm really more here to deliver a promise. We're going to work hard and we're going to get this fixed. And we'll go as far as we can. But we'll go a lot further and we'll get there a lot faster if we can get your help, your advice and your support. And I want to be clear that this isn't about going backward to the past. This is really a new time. You know, the public is at a different place today than when a lot of the environmental laws were enacted. The science wouldn't let us go back uh, to the old ways even if we wanted to. We know more today than we did when these laws were passed. But I don't believe that when it, uh, when it passed these important laws that Congress really had in mind unnecessary and unproductive processes and unproductive procedures. I, I don't think that, um, that we expected the process to, to produce absolute certainty. And that's what we seem to be in the quest of, is absolute certainty for every decision. So I'm dedicated to revising and not just reviewing Forest Service processes to provide better tools, the best tools and training for our line officers and staff. And, and uh, we will do a better job of managing our processes. But I don't want the Forest Service to just get a whole lot better at a bad process. I want us to fix the process and to be good at managing a good process. We've been consulting closely with the Council on Environmental Quality. This report has their stamp of approval. We've been consulting closely with other federal agencies and departments, um, such as Commerce and Interior. Um, they share our desire to improve the effectiveness and the efficiency of our processes. So today I'm asking the members of the subcommittee to look at this report with an open mind and, and, um, and give me a chance to work with you to find a, a way to make Forest Service land management decisions in an effective, efficient, and timely manner that doesn't compromise protection of natural resources that people expect us to manage carefully. So with that, I'm ready to answer questions, and I thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, uh, Chief, for the presentation. Uh, I have a couple points, and then we'll move on for the uh, balance of the committee. Uh, one thing I think would be helpful is education at the uh, local management level within the agency, kind of advice on uh, uh, you know, frivolous lawsuits. I know that every time that the for for our local force service and the number of force that I have make a decision or move it all, somebody always says they're going to sue them. And frankly, uh, I'm a little concerned that, uh, having been a lawyer, uh, I'm a little concerned that our, our employees out there are becoming gun-shy about that, that just throwing that threat at them causes them to retreat or reconsider. Most of the threats of lawsuits are not sustainable in the courts. Now, anybody has a right to file a lawsuit, but whether or not they win in the end, only a small, small percentage would prevail, and, uh, and only a small percentage of those threatened would be filed. And uh, so I, I think that's important. I'd like your comment on that. The second thing, if you would just um, – uh, we've been talking about a very broad picture. Can you point out what you would think would be the most significant factor contributing to the uh, – you know, the gridlock and the stalemate that, that, that we're running into today? If you'd help me with those two, and then we'll move on. Okay, the, um, the, the, your question about or comment about Forest Service people backing off or being afraid to uh, move forward because of the threats of lawsuits, um, you know, obviously that does affect Forest Service people when, they, uh, when someone says, well, we're going we're gonna to file a lawsuit. But I, my experience has been that, that our folks aren't backing off, but they're spending a lot of time trying to make sure that if they do get sued, that they're going to be able to uh, withstand that lawsuit. And so the backing off may be to do some additional analysis to make sure that, you, that your documentation is carefully done uh, to try to resolve the issue with people that are, that are um, considering the lawsuit. And, um, and as, I, as, I use, as I mentioned in my, in my testimony, there's, there's um, things like the best report that will pop up and then we'll go back to all of our other projects and make sure that we've documented the consideration of the best report and then it may be another report uh, you know so so our folks tend to add a lot of stuff into these documents to make sure that they can withstand, withstand a challenge if they're unable to uh, to re resolve it through a collaborative approach um, so i don't think that they're afraid to move forward 
They're just afraid to move forward without strong, without strong documentation and, and, uh, and without strong feeling that they'll be able to withstand the challenge. Now, in terms of the most significant factors that result in some of the, um, uh, the gridlock, I, you know, I, I think if you were to, it, it's, it's very difficult, I guess, to, to try to identify one thing that, that's a big problem. And it's really more of a, of a quilt, of, it's, a, it's an overlapping number of things. It's, you know, that, that's why it's going to be difficult and challenging to try to deal with it, because um, there's so many of them that, you know, you cut one string, but there's still a million other strings that you need to cut. And you need to sort through and figure out which thing, what things will give us the greatest benefit for the, for the time and effort that we take to straighten out. Uh, the, the thing that probably frustrates me the most is um, it would be analysis that needs to be done simply to, to um, overcome a, a challenge as opposed to adding good value to a decision. I support analysis that's going to that's help make a better decision, but I really get frustrated with, uh, with doing work that doesn't seem to add to the value of the decision. I think our, our whole um, climate of, of um, being adverse to any kind of risk is also a problem, um, and particularly when we talk about short-term risk versus long-term. And, uh, and I think that's partly there because of the, of the regulations that have evolved. But we, we, we don't want to take short-term risk, but in the end, we end up with lots of long-term risk in some of these ecosystems. And you can see those examples in the fires that are burning right now. Um. Thank you, Chief. Uh, thank you, Chief. W one point I should probably make in my opening statement, I mentioned about the uh, uh, fact that the Forest Service employee that I ran into in Shakeman, I want you to know that was not one of your management or senior people. It was a lower level. Uh, my relationship with your supervisory personnel and every forest at every level, while we not, haven't always agreed, has always been professional, and I should note that. Mr. Inslee? Uh, thank you, Chief. I want to ask you about the extent of litigation in related to the decisions by the Forest Service. Um, I, I got, did some digging. I found a GAO report that said in 2001 of 1,671 hazardous fuel reduction projects, um, there were a grand total of 20 projects or about 1 percent had been appealed and none had been litigated, zero had been litigated. And then I looked at um, this issue Mr. Hansen brought up. He said that there were 5,000 lawsuits pending against the Forest Service. So I went to take a look what those were about. And I found that the Forest Service documents said that even though you have probably five to 7,000 environmental assessments on various projects a year, you only have 119 cases pending regarding NEPA and 91 regarding the North, uh, the uh, National Forest Management Act, and those overlap. A lot of those have both NEPA and, and the Forest Act both in them, of course. So you've got somewhere from maybe 1 to 2 percent, it appears to me, at most of cases that end up in litigation where you've had some environmental uh, assessment. Um, are those numbers from the GAO and the Forest Service about in the ballpark, or what information could you provide us? Well, I can, um, I'd be happy to, to, to check those out carefully. I would. Just listening, uh, I don't think that they would be out, out of the ballpark. They sounded um, realistic to me, but I'd, I'd need to check that specifically. Now, given, given the fact that, you know, you have competing constituencies interested in their forests, if you're in a 1 to 2 percent level of controversy that ends up in a court system, does that, does that really strike you as unusual or not to be expected when, particularly when you're trying to do cuts in old growth forests? Well, I, um, first, first, the, the first part of my, I want, I want to, I want to uh, talk about whether the lawsuits and the numbers, we're going to have lawsuits. I don't, I'm not, that's not my concern. I, I understand that people are going to challenge and have a right to challenge the decisions that we make. My concern is the evolution of the process, uh, the length of time that it takes for us to work our way through all the process, and in some cases ends up by itself uh, eliminating the project, where we never made a conscious decision to move forward with the project, but just the fact that, we, that it took us so long to work our way through and that we had the challenges, whether appeals or whether lawsuits, really end up making uh, the decision be, get, ends up being made by default. 
rather than having conscious decisions made to do the right things. Uh, in many cases, people don't recognize that there are environmental consequences, adverse environmental consequences, to no action. And when, when decisions are made by default, that's not what the people expect from us. Right. I want to ask you about a way to try to reduce that controversy, if you will, taking the Northwest as an example. Uh, many of us out in the Northwest feel that we have an opportunity to reduce the controversy by trying to move timber harvest activities away from the old growth and mature forests down to the younger forests where we can do thinning, which can allow both resource extraction. In fact, it's been estimated that we could get 600 million board feet out a year in those, some of those lower, younger forests through thinning, commercial thinning. And at the same time, making it more likely that these younger forests will develop quicker into old forest or, uh, or late succession reverse uh, characteristics for habitat purposes. And we think this would be good not only for the environment, but would be good for reducing a lot of the controversy in the Northwest where people would rather see uh, less cutting in the old growth and more in the young growth, if you will. Is, is that something that the Forest Service is considering, is willing to talk with us uh, about? Uh, what are your thoughts in that regard? Well, I'm, I'm willing to talk about any time, to talk about solutions that, uh, that will achieve a broad base of public support, that will meet the needs of, uh, of all sides. I also feel that, um, that that was what we thought we had achieved with the Northwest Plan uh, eight years ago was the balance that had the support of a broad base of, of, of folks, and um, that it was it was the it was the plan that was going to move us forward and and be able to meet the meet the needs of all sides, significantly reduce the amount of the amount of uh, harvest that was that was being done, which was fine, and also protected uh, spotted owl and other uh, other uh, species, and yet that lasted about two years before it before it became controversial. And so that's part of the frustration that some of our folks have in trying to work our way through these kind of things. Uh, thank you, Chief. Chief, before I go on, I, I just want to point out that one of those 1 or 2 percent that's on appeal is currently on fire in Colorado. Uh, Mr. Tancredo. Yeah, that's really good. Um, we can talk about the actual numbers, how many, uh, how much of your process is being impeded by the appeal and or litigation process, but let's just go through one specific example. The Upper South Platte Watershed Restoration Project. 96 to 2000, we have the Buffalo Creek High Meadow fires. They, they burn a big chunk of 23,000 acres in Pike and San Isabel National Forest, destroying 100 homes and other structures. Um, watershed damage, uh, uh, estimated in excess of $10 million. Um, in August of 1999, Forest Service begins to develop a fire management plan for thinning in the roadless and roaded areas of the Pike National Forest. It goes from 1999 to 2001. 2001 September, environmentalist groups appealed the plan. November 2001 to January 2002, the Forest Service negotiates a scaled back management plan with the environmentalist groups. March 4th, 2002, on the final day to appeal the plan that the environmentalist groups who helped negotiate the plan to begin with appealed it. Um, the regional forester rejected their appeals on April 2001. Of course, there's nothing really now. We anticipated at that point in time litigation would be filed. Litigation would be undertaken by these same groups because that's their next step after all this, all these obstacles that they put in the way, finally they want to litigate. Well now, there's nothing really to litigate because the whole damn forest is burning down. So there really isn't a reason for them to go to court at this present time. But this is one example of how it works. And I don't know how many others are out there, but this is one too many. And we want to do something about this. We have to do something about this. We have to relieve you of the burden at the point that we can interject ourselves into this. I think that's our responsibility. I, I would like you to comment on the concept of charter forests as they may be able to, affect, to actually affect the decision-making process. 
I know that it really is nothing more than a concept. I have a bill. I'm not asking you to address that bill. You haven't even seen it. We just dropped it yesterday. But it's just one idea. It's just, our bill is just one way of looking at the whole concept of charter force. I'd like you to, to just talk, tell me what you think about the general idea of giving greater flexibility to people on the ground, to people in the area, to manage that force, relieving you of some of the uh, uh, in some of the regulatory burden that is uh, there initially, and um, whether you think this is a way for us to go conceptually, not any specific bill or anything like that. Well, first, I'd like to thank you for talking about the South Platte watershed because I was going to talk about it at some point in here through a question, if um, if I if I could, because I think it's an extremely good example. You may you may go right ahead. <laughs> uh, it's an extremely good example of the problem that faces us. If we had been doing fuels treatment for the last um, last eight or ten years in there, uh, the, we would still have a fire. That fire would be burning entirely differently than what it's burning now, and, uh, and it would be one that wouldn't be threatening homes, in my view, if we'd been doing the work. The figures that I have said that uh, that we spent forty million dollars in fire suppression costs on Buffalo Creek Fire and High Meadows Fire. Do you know what we can do with forty million dollars in terms of trying to treat the land, especially if we didn't spend half of it on planning? We'd be able to get a lot of work done out on the ground that would uh, help protect communities from uh, catastrophic wildfire and help pro help protect municipal watersheds. So I, uh, I mean, it's and it's a great example. It's on fire right now. You're right. There is no need for us to proceed now with. Uh, fuel treatment because the fuel's gone. As far as charter forests, um, I think that the notion of charter forest has, has a, a, a fair amount of potential. I mean, the idea of, it's, it's a sort of a skeleton idea that we're still trying to put some flesh on the bones yeah. to really get, to, to get some, and we're looking for ideas on how that, uh, how that might work. And I think this, this subcommittee held a hearing on, uh, on some of those ideas. Um, and any time that we think we can get greater flexibility uh, for our line officers in the field, in my opinion, that uh, that's good. I believe we have we have good line officers out there that work with the public, and so the more flexibility we can give them, I think that's that's good. My only concern about about charter forest would be that I don't want us to sit back and wait until we have identified charter forest and then 10 years later learn from them before we start trying to fix the process problems that we have right now. Um, so. So I, I think we need to continue to have the dialogue about charter forests, about whether it'll work, uh, how we might put them together, where we might want to do it, but at the same time, try and move forward with fixing the, fixing the, the processes that we have that are, that are um, very difficult to work our way through right now. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I might also point out further in that fire that we're experiencing today, which is now about 100,000 acres, that also includes acreage that was not designated to be thinned but would have been protected had the designated acreage had been thin, it would have been thin. So now we have a pile of ash of areas that we thought were in good shape and didn't need to go in there and were almost of a wilderness type setting and they're gone and I would guess that the youngest person in here, for example, from my parents' home, the mountain that they've viewed for all of their life, that the youngest person in this room may be lucky at the later stages of their life to see that same vegetation come back. So uh, let's see. Uh, Go over Mr. Udall. Uh, yeah, Mr. Udall. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chief, you, you mentioned um, when, when you were asked about uh, gridlock problems, what, what, um, what was it that, that, uh, that was causing them? And, and, and one of the things you said was doing work that doesn't improve the decision, that you don't um, you don't like to do that additional work and the cost that it entails. And that seems to me to be a really fine balance in terms of the management of your agency and your people that are on the front line as to how much you do, how much public involvement, and, and those kinds of things. I mean, I don't really see that is subject to a law that, that unless we were doing something collaborative, as you're aware of their collaborative, uh, that we're discussing the idea of collaborative legislation, and, and I would invite my uh, uh, colleague, Mr. Tancredo from Colorado, to join me and Mr. Simpson and, and Mr. Otter and others that are, and, and my uh, cousin here that are discussing collaborative ways. But it seems to me when you, uh, 
talk about doing work that doesn't improve the decision, it's hard for us to pass a law that says, you know, don't do work that doesn't improve the decision. That seems to be, to be a management issue within the Forest Service. Could you comment on that? I mean, you know, people, yeah, go ahead. Let's see if you can. Okay, well, first I'd like, let me just, um, in terms of, 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 of the problem, you know, there's lots of parts of the problem, but essentially, to me, the problem is that, that we have Stone Age rules we're working with, and we're in a dot-com world today. The, the, the rules that we're dealing with were developed 30 years ago in a lot of cases. When I think back of, of what was going on 30 years ago, you know, I was using a slide rule for crying out loud. You know, we didn't have things like the, like the Internet that we worked with. We didn't have GPS or GIS. We didn't have the capabilities that we have today. And, and we have a huge amount of information today because of the technology changes that we didn't have years ago. But yet we still are trying to, we're, we're trying to gather all that data, all that information that we have the capability to gather and make decisions using everything because we can or because it's there. I don't believe that it's Congress's job or responsibility or I have no expectations that Congress solve that problem for us. All I want from you is some support and, um, and, and some advice on where we might be able to, uh, to, to help with, with some of the, of the uh, uh, analysis that, that is excessive. And um, again, a lot of that has evolved because of case law, because we, because we lose a lawsuit uh, that said we need to go out and gather more data or more information, so then on all of our future projects, we go out and gather that data or do that analysis. Then we lose a lawsuit somewhere else that says, well, you didn't, you didn't consider the best report. So we go back and now all of our documents consider the best report. Then we have a lawsuit that says you need to go gather a soil sample in every drainage, even if you're going to log with a helicopter. So we go do that on all of them. And so it's the continuous piling on of additional um, requirements that, that, we, that we've put on ourselves in some cases or that, that we've evolved to through case law in some cases. But no, I don't expect Congress to pass a law to say that, you know, this is the limit of your analysis. The, Chief, the other thing you mentioned was, was uh, adversity to risk. And, and I presume you're talking about employees within the for, Forest Service, the, the way you discussed it, who uh, aren't willing to take the risk and they, they're worried about the short term and then that has long term impacts. I, I once again, that seems to be an internal management issue. I mean, you're, you're, you need to empower your um, Forest Service supervisors and people on the front line uh, to take those risks that need to be taken to get the forest healthy, to get uh, to prevent the kinds of things that are happening in Colorado and New Mexico today. And I, I don't, it, that's I don't see a specific law there either. You know, passing laws saying employees take more risks. I mean, I, and I and I, I would be willing to admit I think Congress is part of the problem because when some of your supervisors are courageous and are bold and step out there and do something creative, members of Congress go and get them fired. So, it, you know, it's a it's a as you move up the agency. And you and you do those kinds of things. It's a it's a tough thing. Do you want to comment on that? Well, yeah, I I think um, our organization, like any organization, has quite a variety of different um, uh, different views. You know, with 35,000 employees, we have uh, we we pretty much reflect. Uh, I think uh, what's out in the general <laughs> general populace. I believe that that most of our employees are willing to take risks, but we put a lot of processes in place that that require them to do some things that would be risk averse. In, in other words. Um, if we, an example would be that if we, if we can't predict almost 100 percent what the consequences of a decision will be, we're very vulnerable to losing a case in court. Um, it's impossible to predict 100 percent, and I'm not sure that it's that it's a smart thing to do to spend all of our money trying to be 100 percent sure of what the consequences are going to be. It would make more sense to me to spend a lot less money on that, monitor carefully, and make adjustments as you go. Our processes really don't allow for that. Um, I think things like the Endangered Species Act, for example, um, or at least the uh, implementing regulations and our processes really require very little short-term risk. In other words, you can't do some things that are going to, that, that may have uh, an effect, or you have to be very, very, very careful if you're going to do something that may have an effect, even if what you're trying to do is, 
is uh, going to be of the long-term benefit to that particular species. Uh, so, uh, so I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't want to throw it all on the fact that Forest Service folks aren't willing to take risk. I think many of our folks are willing to take risk, but uh, we have put a lot of a lot of disincentives in their way to be able to take the appropriate kinds of risk. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Udall, with all due respect, I'm not aware of any case where a congressman called up and got a federal forest employee fired. I don't think oh, that... Oh, there are numerous instances. No, Mr. I mean, Bosworth, I'll well, let me ask the chief. You. Chief, do you... Well, the chief man, that puts him in a tough situation. Mr. Udall, I have the floor. Situation. I have the floor. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a sensitive point with me. Uh, chief, let me ask you this. If any member of Congress called you up on, on the merits of that complaint alone, not on other merits that may necessitate the firing, although I don't think very many federal employees ever get fired. Uh, Chief, would you terminate somebody based on a phone call from the congressman? Would I? No, I wouldn't. Are you um, aware of this termination of taking place while you've been in the administration I've because of the call been, I, of a congressman? I've never been asked to fire a Forest Service employee by a congressman. I have been asked to move a Forest Service employee or two. Uh, <laughs> well, that's appropriate. I mean, there's some times where you... And let me... Oh, well. oh. And, and I'm let not me, sure let that me the clarify Forest Service employee that. I think really understands the... Um, sure. And let, me, and let me clarify that, Mr. Udall. If you have a, a for example, in our community, uh, in the community that I grew up in, if we've got a force, and a lot of times our force, our regional force uh, supervisor is brought in from out of the area, and if they have a difficult time with the community and the community is upset, I, I feel an obligation to relay that message uh, to, the, to the chief. But I think that the civil service system and others uh, give protections out there. So I, I don't want this fear laid out there that all we do is pick up a phone call and the chief uh, terminates somebody. Well, I, if I may, I'd also... Go I, ahead, and then we'll go on to Mr. Hayward. I would also like to say that while I have been, I have been called and asked to move somebody, I have never moved anybody based upon a, a request from a congressman. Not, not that I don't respect your advice a lot, but... Um, <laughs> That's, that's good. Hang in there and keep doing it. Well, now, to clarify that, he has not gotten a call from me to, to move anybody either. So, uh, Mr. Hayward. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, Chief, I don't know, maybe some of those calls will be coming in, in the days ahead. Uh, to get this out of personalities uh, and um, the employment situation, it seems to me we have, a, we have an essential problem here. Um, does the process gridlock you've described limit your ability as the Forest Service to protect communities, watersheds, and old growth forests from the forces of catastrophic fire? I believe they do. I believe that um, I think that, that the example in, in uh, Colorado right now is, is a good example. If, if, um, if our processes were, were more simplified, we were able to make more uh, make decisions more timely, um, and be able to get a larger percentage of the dollars that are appropriated to us um, on the ground and less in the office doing analysis. I believe we'd get we'd have uh, many situations where where fire would not burn through the the, uh, the area in a catastrophic way like it does, and that it would be the kind of fire that's much more uh, light on the land. Yeah. So I think there's a numerous situations where uh, would that be the case. Chief, I want to thank you again, uh, not only for coming down to visit with us today, but uh, a chance we had to uh, visit informally in the past uh, on, on some issues. And again, I commend uh, the chairman of the subcommittee for next week's hearings on the uh, New Education Land Grant Act. Uh, and I just want to return to that briefly in the time allotted to me. Let me congratulate uh, you. Uh, I understand the Chattahoochee Oconee National Forest in Georgia will complete the first grant under the act passed unanimously by this house and by the senate uh, and signed by president clinton in his final few days in office and what is gratifying at least in terms of this georgia experience is that the entire process from the school district application to the conveyance of the land has taken less than a year uh, and so I think we have an example of, of how things were envisioned as working, certainly as the author of the legislation. There's no gridlock there, but I'd be remiss, and we've spoken informally, and indeed I've been uh, honored this morning to talk to the Undersecretary for Natural Resources at the uh, Ag Department, uh, Mark Ray, about what has transpired in Arizona. School districts have applied, I think specifically about the Grand Canyon District, uh, the applications have had no action taken on them, and 
there is a prime example of the gridlock and inertia that we're talking about. Uh, Chief, from your perspective, uh, the gridlock, and you said cause number three is the Forest Service itself, Forest Service culture. Could you explain why the similar projects with similar intent and identical processes receive such disparate treatment? Uh, th my understanding is is the, that the project on the Chattahoochee Oconee um, actually started the EA actually started five years ago under and I believe they were trying to do this under the Township Act, and uh, then when the legislation was passed, they were able to um, to they thought that'd be a better tool to accomplish it with, and so they moved forward with trying to do it under uh, under the more recent legislation and the the um, but the work the EA the the the, the, the work I complain about. Um, the amount of analysis and some of those kind of things that actually started five years ago on the uh, in Georgia, if, if if my information is correct. Chief, do you see a difference as well? Um, uh, some of us uh, ran for this job because of what was perceived to be a war on the West, uh, an effort to uh, to so restrict the use of the forest, uh, so as to uh, disallow just about every human involvement, it would seem, and it's at some uh, juncture. Uh, and uh, you mentioned earlier litigation. Is there, has there just grown up in, in terms of the risk-averse behavior, especially in forests in the West? Uh, has, there, has there been a, a kind of, a, a, I guess, a, a, a group think that has gone on that says, well, gee, we have to deal so much with litigation. We have to deal with fire danger. Boy, this education thing, it's nice, but it's, it's not urgent. Therefore, its importance drops further down the list in terms of, for lack of a better term, public policy triage or priorities. Well, I, um, you know, I'd, I, I'm, I'd have to be, I'd have to speculate because I haven't, um, I haven't sat down specifically with the folks, uh, our Forest Service folks, in say the Tonto National Forest to find out where they have that in their in their priority list. I know that that when those folks on the Tonto National Forest are trying to sort through with several million visitors a year that are coming onto the National Forest, they're trying to be good hosts too and, uh, and trying to deal with the fire situations like they, they're dealing with, that something like that may not be as a high priority in their mind. And then, uh, you know, frankly, our funding levels sometimes don't allow for some, some of those lands projects, lands type issues, um, that's one of the areas we're historically underfunded in. So, um, so that may be part of the, part of the problem is it hasn't, that uh, needs to be a higher priority, and we've heard your concern about it, and uh, and we've we're making sure that the folks out there understand that concern that we move forward. I think we can work our way through and make that work well. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chairman. You may have to call and get somebody fired out there, <laughs> Mr. Udall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chief, I wanted to move uh, after preliminary remarks to the to the overall report, but I I did just want to say that. Uh, those of us from Colorado, I think, feel today particularly uh, uh, sadness and despair and a sense of helplessness when it comes to this fire in, in Colorado. And as we look to understand the causes of it and then to look towards problem solving for the future, it's uh, only human to uh, begin to look at places to point fingers and, and place uh, some blame. I think there's probably a lot of blame to go around, but I think we could also put some of the responsibility on Mother Nature for what's happening in Colorado. It's the, we're, we're in the uh, throes of a, a four-year drought cycle. Uh, the old-timers say it's the fiercest drought we've seen in over a, a hundred years. And uh, we've had very dry, hot, and windy weather, which has compounded the process. So m my appeal to all of us is to continue to work together uh, to find ways to return our forest to a healthier condition and prevent, hopefully, these kinds of fires over the the long term. And I think there are a lot of really great ideas to move us in that uh, direction. But if we face off uh, and put every uh, different groups and stakeholders in the corners of the ring, uh, and we have four or five different uh, stakeholders in different corners of the ring, I don't know that we're going to be able to move in the direction you've suggested we could move. We just received the report uh, in the last, I think, 24 hours. I haven't had a chance to fully digest it look forward to looking it over, but in your comments, you, you uh, said that you uh, were going to begin uh, to act, not just to review things. And What do you uh, consider that you would do next to, uh, along that, uh, the lines of, of bringing action to the table? Um, 
I, for, before I answer that, I'd like to go back to your the first part of your of your comment. Sure. There. I don't want, and I don't think it's valuable to sit back and try to point fingers at somebody that might be at fault for this or that. I want it to be clearly understood that I believe the environmental laws are good laws. And I also believe that, that most people that question our decisions do it with, um, with a lot of concern and care about how the land is being managed. So when people uh, are questioning our decisions through appeals or through litigation, um, that's part of our democratic process. Yes. Um, but we don't have to have our processes internally so bound up that we can't do those things faster and, and do them with uh, more thought for the future. We, we, that's why I would like to have, a, have us take a hard look at these, at these processes so that we can make timely decisions and that people will have their day in court if they really want to have their day in court. I also believe that our, our processes are disincentives for mm -hmm. people coming to the table to collaborate. You know, there are places around the country that, that the community groups that are popping up all over the country, yes. you know, these community-based forestry groups that really want to work together, and they're made up of people from the environmental side, from industry, from business, from uh, NGOs that, that really want to work together for the betterment of their community and for the lands that surround their community. And, uh, and yet, our process, it's very frustrating for them because they'll work together and come up with a proposal, and they'll work hard to do that, and then it takes us two years or two and a half years to go through the, 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 the stuff. You know, they don't want to come back and work every night or one night a week for the next year when it takes us two or three more years to implement it on the ground. So we've got to do some, make some changes that will, that will allow those things to happen in a more timely way mm -hmm. um, to encourage that kind of community-based collaboration that results in decisions that I believe are more satisfactory for a broader range of people. So if, if I might interrupt you, I think that's in part what my cousin, uh, Mr. Udall from New Mexico mentioned in regards to the conversations he's having with Congressman Otter and others about how, how do we value everybody's input but create, create that collaborative environment within everybody pull together once the decision was made. And, and in some cases, if, um, if people don't, um, if they can get everything they want without coming to the table and, and, and working in a collaborative way, then there's not a whole lot of incentive to come to the table. And there are situations where these groups will work together and some won't be involved and then we'll get the, then we'll get the appeals and the lawsuits that will delay the activities. So, so we need to look at, and we will look at, at ways that we can make the, the, the community-based collaborative forestry approach work better and to have more incentives. Uh, in terms of, um, of steps that, that, that I want to take, um, there's, there's a number of things that we need to move forward with very quickly, I think. One is that we got to, I want to, as I said in my testimony, I want to have our, uh, our, our deputy chief get a, a team together to start looking at our internal processes. There's some training kinds of things that we need to do. Our folks need to be better at, um, at project management. How do you deliver a project within time, within budget? Um, we need to put some training into our folks along those, those lines. I think that um, we, while we have, we have a person that's located at the Council on Environmental Quality right now, one of our Forest Service folks, to work as a, uh, as a liaison between us and CEQ to see what things can take place within our Forest Service regulations that will, that will help and then what things that, that maybe CEQ could look at within their regulations. I met with the, with the Director of the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, within the last two days to talk about opportunities that we might have to, to um, to, do, to look at our regulations that, that, that we live with under that Fish and Wildlife Service has responsibility for that will also um, try, to, try to see if there's some ways that we can make the, the process work more effectively. So those are some of the things that we need to do right away. Excellent. That's helpful to me, and I look forward to hearing more about those steps you're going to take and, uh, and working with the committee to support you in that process. Thank Thanks, you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Otter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chief, once again, thanks for being here, and I certainly appreciate your responses uh, thus far to, uh, to both sides. I was, uh, I was told some time back, uh, in fact, I think it was a year, maybe two years ago, of an incident that happened down in uh, Northern California. And it, it seems as though uh, there was a process that the Forest Service had gone through to design uh, a program cut uh, put it out for bid, uh, uh, everything went through the process, and it was either maybe it was a disease or perhaps it was a salvage, and I apologize for not knowing the whole story firsthand. But 
at one point, uh, and as, I guess it must have been a burn, because we know that we've got about an 18 to 24 month window when we burn through a forest, we either get in and get it out in 18 to 24 months or it's gone. Is that not right? That's generally correct, yeah. Anyway, there was a drop dead date on it when it uh, wasn't going to be any good. Anyway, uh, as the process moved forward and the bid had been let and the cut was to begin, then a group came in and uh, stayed the, the, the beginning of the cut, uh, the beginning of the salvage, um, and said for whatever reasons, maybe not all the rules and regulations were followed to their satisfaction. But it went before this judge, and this is what was in, intriguing to me, and the judge says, well, says, you know, you may well be right. Perhaps this uh, report is a bit deficient. And uh, you, have, uh, you have a good reason to delay this. But I just want to tell you this. You, this intervening group, are going to put up a $900,000 bond in order, just in case uh, we, don't, we find out that it's not true. And just in case that we actually lose what value is there, just in case there is an economic damage. And so if you are going to enter this as an aggrieved person and, you f and delay this process, which Mother Nature is going to take her toll within a 24 month, 18 to 24 month period, then you're going to have to put up the bond. Do you think that perhaps something like that, uh, that we could codify something like that? And so some of these, uh, Mr. Inslee's right, and I never ever thought I would hear anybody in Congress uh, talk about there's not enough lawsuits. I was kind of shocked at, uh, at that whole process that we went through, that we need more lawsuits and 1%. 1 percent isn't enough. It's not doing enough damage to the process already. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm wondering out loud here if there can be some kind of a sharing of the pain and a sharing of the burden uh, for those who would bring lawsuits and then just to delay the process, get them to the front door, settle the lawsuit, after we've gone through all that process, in fact, I one time was thinking of introducing a bill in Idaho that said that the lawyer that brought the lawsuit, if the plaintiff couldn't pay it off, the lawyer had to pay it off. And that didn't get very far. We had too many uh, lawyers. Anyway, uh, back, to my, uh, back to my codification. Uh, could we codify uh, some kind of that uh, rendering the process more fair or more reasonable? Um, you know, I've given some thought to something like this, uh, some in the past, although I haven't, I haven't, uh, I'm not, certainly not an expert on the ramifications of, of something like that. I, I, have, I will admit that, that I'm somewhat uneasy of, uh, of doing anything that doesn't allow people to have an equal access to, um, to justice. Uh, although right now it feels to me to some degree like there's, like there's one side that you know, there's there's some people that have an interest in the national forest that don't have access to the courts um, over some of the decisions that we make, and and uh, anything that we can do to level that w would probably be good. I don't know if that's the right solution that you're proposing or not. I'd be more than happy to give it some thought and maybe maybe um, get back with you and talk with you about well, it. I, I believe that I believe that anything that we can do, or most anything that we can do, that will encourage or create incentives. For people to come to the table, and um, or, or better yet, come to the woods uh, together with differing differing positions and points of view, and try to search to, for solutions and collaborate, I think is good. If if something like that would help uh, as an incentive to get people to come to the woods and collaborate, then I think it's something that should be thought about, because right now there's just too many incentives to not come to the table or come to the woods and, and try to sort through what the choices might be. Well, I think in your earlier statement, you made it very clear and it was very profound that you're not always going to satisfy all sides. And in many times, folks that are engaged in the process, when they didn't get 100 percent of what they wanted and they only got a percent of what they wanted, uh, then they still engage in the legal uh, uh, in, the in trying to get a legal decision rendered on a process that their negotiation failed at and their collaboration failed at. I, I would just be, I, I'm the, my main concern is no matter what we come up with, 
uh, to engage in collaboration. No matter, no matter how hard we extend ourselves across the table, uh, as Mr. the Mr. Udall and myself and Mr. Simpson and Ms. McCollum and a few others have done, no matter how hard we try, there's still going to be one group out there by the name of Alf or Elf or something that can still file the lawsuit and still stop the process. And so if, if it were truly good, well-intended, reasonable people meeting, trying to come to a common sense solution, and if we could count on that, I wouldn't have a problem. But I, I hope that uh, in your process of looking these things over, you'll look at what we can tweak legally to make those who would in, endanger the entire collaborative process simply by bringing lawsuits pay for the punishment that they're delivering to us. I would be happy to, to look at that and to work with you on that. I, I, again, the, 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 the frustration is that um, when we try to bring people together and try to come up with solutions, and then we come up with a solution that all people have bought into, and then there's folks that are way outside of that that can stop the projects or, or significantly slow them down to where you know the decisions are made by default, um, that, that isn't working, and that's just simply not good government in my viewpoint. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Chief, if you don't mind, we'd like to take, uh, we, we'll adjourn this in about uh, 15 or 20 minutes. Is that all right if we go another 15 or 20 minutes? That's just fine. I could talk about this all day. Great. Well, we, I know you've got a lot of priorities, and I know you want to pay some attention to what's going on out there with those uh, fires, but that'll give us a few more minutes. And Mr. Inslee, you said you'd like yes. to make some more comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, before I ask a question, I want to correct a misinterpretation. My friend, Mr. Rotter, has suggested that that we needed more lawsuits, I think, and actually it's the reverse. In heaven there are no lawsuits and we'd like to bring heaven to earth. But we have seen in Northwest repeated instances where citizens had to go to court to get to Forest Service to follow the law. And this Betcha case that you've alluded to, the Chief has alluded to, I think is one example of that where four district courts, it took four judges to tell the Forest Service on four separate occasions to follow the law. And now I'm pleased to hear that the chief is that you're incorporating that new science in your assessment, but it took four judges to tell the Forest Service to finally follow the law, and I think that's unfortunate. I want to ask about the Colorado fire because there's been reference to the Upper South Platte project, and it's been suggested uh, that somehow this cataclysmic fire, which is causing such devastation in Colorado right now, is somehow due to your failure chief or, uh, or Congress's failure. And my understanding in Colorado, although I haven't been there during the fires, this is the worst drought in over 100 years. There's been absolutely a terrible combination of wind and lack of moisture. The fires jumped the Colorado River in a four-lane interstate. It's a huge cataclysmic event. And that the South Platte project, uh, two-thirds of it uh, could have started last September. There was an appeal as a third of it last September, but at a minimum, it would have taken five to eight years to implement in any event, and that it appears clear this project would not have been done uh, by the time this fire blew up. And I want to make sure I understand your testimony. You're not telling us that if this appeal hadn't been fired that we wouldn't, we wouldn't have a big fire in Colorado, are you? No, uh, not at all. In fact, I think I said that, um, you know, if we would have been actively managing that 10 years ago and accomplished uh, fuels treatment in a, in a broad landscape way for the last 10 years, we could have made a difference. Right. If we would have started 10 years ago. And I think it's important to, to note that the reason for the need for fuel suppression is because the Forest Service and Congress and Republicans and Democrats, you know, we didn't understand the science and we put out fires for decades and decades and decades, which allowed this fuel to build up on the forest floor, which created these huge dynamite-like conditions, because we didn't follow the science, and we made rash judgment without thinking about the science. And I think one of the, the frustrations we all have in decision-making right now is that following the science sometimes can be a pain. It's just a pain to have to follow the science. But we didn't follow the science for 30 years, and now we're in this situation where these forests are blowing up. And I just want to make that kind of editorial comment. I want to ask you one more thing, if I can, um, and that is about the drought in Colorado. 
Uh, according to the report that the White House issued about two weeks or week ago or two weeks ago about global warming, uh, they concluded, and the, the best scientific minds of the federal government concluded, that global warming is happening, that it is caused by and large significant amounts by human activities, that global warming will cause significant climactic changes in the United States, and among those will be repeated and more severe droughts in the western United States that would have not only the result of reducing our irrigation supplies due to lack of snowmelt, but would also, as I understand the report, would expose our forests to much more cataclysmic fires, as we're experiencing color right now, Colorado right now because of the very low, low moisture levels in the forests. And yet, to the nation's chagrin, the President of the United States said he wasn't going to do anything about it. He decided that we just had to get used to it. He decided that we just had to have a strategy of adaptation rather than facing this, what I consider an imminent threat to our forest ecosystems and a lot of other things we hold dear in this country. Now, I'd like to ask you what the Forest Service is doing in its decision making to deal with global climate change, what you think challenges it poses to you, and basically what your advice has been to the president in this regard, who is, as far as I can tell, has just decided to ignore the problem. I'd like your thoughts in that regard. Okay, I, I'd be happy to do that. I'd, I'd first like to go back to the, your comments about the Bester report, because I see the world maybe a little bit differently than, than that. Uh, first, um, there were four court cases. Two, two were decided in the Forest Service favor. Two were decided in the, uh, the, the, the other way. And the, the two said that it was needed, you know, that need to be referenced, and two said that it wasn't. Um, there's differences of opinion when you go to different courts. And to me, it's not as clear as simply whether we're following the law. I, um, uh, the law doesn't, isn't very specific about whether you're going to follow the best report. Our folks, go, they, they do uh, the analysis. Um, but again, we end up adding on and adding on and adding on. And, that's, and I believe that makes my point about where we're headed in terms of, of some of these situations. Also, I would say that, as I said in my testimony, the Bester Report was not a peer-reviewed document. It wasn't published in a journal, in a scientific journal. It was just a, an opinion piece by some very good scientists, but it was an opinion piece. It wasn't peer-reviewed. And yet, now we have to make sure we analyze that and consider that and document that and put it in the EIS. Um, so, so I just wanted to clear that up. Again, I don't want Chief, to... Chief, can um, I interrupt you just for a moment? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, if I... It's all right. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Let, I'll, I'll come back if I can. Well, I was just going to go to the global warming discussion, so... Uh, <clears throat> gentlemen, um, Mr. Hayworth, I'd also like a few minutes, so if we can wrap up this exchange in about the next three or four minutes, it'd be great. Uh, let me just finish on the global warming question. Uh, to me, you know, we do have research that's going on in our Forest Service uh, Research and Development Program that ties in with global warming. But to me, the, uh, the, one of the most urgent things that we can do is make sure that the way that we're managing the national forest will be managed in a way that will be, uh, be able to take into consideration uh, uh, climate changes. If you have, if you had the, the, the situation on the national forests um, 100 years ago where there were much fewer trees on the land. You know, there, a lot of these uh, drier pine types we have around uh, the interior west um, may have had 20, 30, 40 trees per acre. Now some of them have 500, 600, 1,000 trees per acre. Uh, when you do have yes. drought conditions uh, and you have that many trees sucking up the moisture, those trees get weakened. They are more susceptible to insects and diseases. They die. You end up with a uh, much increased fuel uh, situation. And so. Our job then would it make sense that we do the thinning from below that needs to be done, that we put fire back in a controlled manner, that we keep more of the, uh, of the fuel loading down so that when you have the inevitable fires, they're going to burn in a different way, not in the, not in the uh, catastrophic way that many of these fires are burning right now. Thank you. We're, we're hoping the President at some point will join us in an effort to stop global warming instead of just trying to clean up the forest. But just one more comment, if I can, Chief. I just, and this is a small point, but I need to make it. Uh, where I got the issue, the information about Betcher was your testimony, which says, quote, in four of these cases, the courts have concluded that project decisions violated NEPA because the associated NEPA documents did not adequately document the agency's consideration of Betcher. Close quote. I just want to point that out. I'm sorry if I misinterpreted your comment, but that's what. No, that, and that's correct. It. <laughs> four, four went one way and two went the other way. That's the actual facts. Uh, thanks, Chief. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chief. And will uh, Mr. Hayworth? 
I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm so glad we're not playing politics here at the uh, uh, at this hearing, and, uh, all working together. Um, let me let me just make sure I understand, Chief, and, and maybe this is somewhat of the chicken or the egg argument. <clears throat> Whatever one's dispensation on on global warming, if I understood your comments just a second ago, uh, to deal with reducing the risk of catastrophic fire. Uh, if we were to rank how to deal with the challenges we confront, effective forest management would probably have more to do with alleviating some of the challenges we confront than, uh, than theories uh, in terms of global temperature at this juncture. Well, there's no question in my mind that the best way for us to be dealing with uh, the potential for catastrophic fire around communities is active forest management which primarily would be removing some of the material, mostly smaller diameter material from below, and reintroducing fire in a controlled manner. You know, it's interesting to me when I was, uh, and, uh, before coming here as a, as a private citizen, I recall reading accounts of testimony before this very committee uh, in a Congress where control just happened to be on the other side, where folks came here and testified that a fire corridor was developing from Idaho to our border with Mexico because of our failure to effectively deal with the fuel situation and effective thinning and effective management. And I think the key distinction, perhaps upon which we can all agree, whatever disagreements may be the vagaries of being 150 days out from a midterm or something to that effect, but who's counting, um, uh, is, is the fact that sound science should always be utilized. And I know it doesn't happen on your watch, but uh, the chairman and others uh, have made points that we've seen, sadly, in Washington state, the planting and false reporting of lynx hair in fish and wildlife uh, situations by fish and wildlife uh, biologists. When politics overtakes sound science, no matter the number of lawsuits, no, no matter how close in proximity we may be to another political campaign, when we substitute emotion for sound science, we sacrifice the well-being and the intent of what should transpire and we see the results in catastrophic ways. I yield back. Hey, Mr. Hayworth, I might point out that uh, those employees involved in that Lynx thing were not terminated despite any request by Congress. In fact, they got a pay raise and a bonus. Got a bonus. I mean, a bonus and a promotion. So, uh, <laughs> it's not way I put it. Uh, <laughs> Chief, let me uh, mention a couple things. Um, I'd like to get a little more information on the carbon sequestration program. I know we don't have time today, but that de deals with some of the global warming. We got into this global warning, warming issue here. It's, it, it, we could have a hearing all on that alone. It's very interesting on both sides of the, uh, that issue, and at some point I hope we get to discuss it in the future. I want to um, mention one thing, and that is if you have some specific things you think Congress can do to assist you in solving the process gridlock, I can assure you that I see as much gridlock in Congress as I do in some of these agencies. So. We are not speaking with clean hands in regards to that. But that's kind of the political nature we have. We don't, it, it, it's kind of tough, but I appreciate that. And again, I just, I just want to tell you, I mean, I was there, I was on Storm King. I've been in a number of your situations, uh, your fires out there. And uh, you, you guys, boy, when the siren goes off, uh, you heed the call, you've heeded it well. Uh, and I just want to compliment uh, you and the community. And, and you know, it was neat. We had uh, mutual aid. So until we were able to get your type one and your professionals in there, our local professionals from several different communities came. And uh, uh, it was, uh, I guess we were still a little gun shy from Storm King. And for those of you in the audience, that's where we had 14 of our firefighters uh, die on the mountain. So anyway, Chief, uh, kudos to you for what you're doing out there. and. Uh, Godspeed for your men and women out there fighting that fire. It's a dangerous thing, and we appreciate very much your time today. Appreciate the time of the committee. The uh, committee now stands in adjournment. Thank you. Good luck out
still to come tonight on C-SPAN.